All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session, How to Build Serverless Event-Driven Microservices Systems with Calyx. So in this session, really what I'm going to be showing you is the uh, how to build, like the title says, the event-driven part. So I'm really going to be focused a lot on event-driven design. And I think what's going to be interesting is some of the uh, kind of guided design uh, driven approach to this, uh, this process where because of some of the ways things work in an event driven system and also with Calyx and just the realities of doing distributed systems, things like that, there's, I think there'll be some surprising uh, outcomes of uh, what it actually takes to do an, an event driven design like this. I know it's for me, it's been a, an amazing, uh, about a year now doing this with Calyx and finally getting into something where I can stick my teeth into building event-driven systems. I've been talking about it and doing it to some degree for, for some years now. I've been talking about event-driven at conferences and uh, blogs and uh, webinars and things like that. But now because of, of Calyx, it's gotten so much easier to do it. It's, it's, a, it's a quite amazing. So let's get going. So like I said, we're going to dive pretty deeply into event-driven design in this session. So um, it would help if you have some familiarity with Calyx. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details that I often do in many of the other videos and, and content that I produce around, produce around Calyx in this video. So if there's something that I'm not covering here, there's plenty of other resources to find. I've done a bunch of videos. Other people have done videos on Calyx. And you should be able to find, uh, and of course, there's a documentation. So you should be able to find the, some of the basics. But here, this is a bit more advanced, and we're going to go into the design. Now, never fear. If you're not that familiar with uh, Calyx yet, this is really about kind of the fundamentals of designing uh, event-driven systems. And, um, and that process. So I'm not going to get into code or, or, or things like that. This is really about the conceptual process. So I'm going to be walking you through the design of this demo application that I've been using for a while now. And I think it's a really good representation. I've wanted to dive deep into the design of this for a long time. And I've kind of covered it to some degree in other um, videos that I've done. But this time I'm going to go pretty deep into uh, the, the flow here. And uh, it was really interesting for me to, to walk through the process. And I'll also kind of share with you my experience as I was working through the design of this. And I was, and actually what was happening, I was unlearning things that I've known for years about building, say, stateless. CRUD like you know, CRUD types of systems that have been building that those types of systems for decades, and to really get into an event driven type of a, a process and design, um, it really kind of I had to kind of let go of some things that I just took as you know, almost kind of intuitive ways of doing things, and kind of you know rewire my brain to to do things in in a more event driven way. It, I can. I, I hopefully you'll see that it's, it's great fun. Your head will hurt. I think the first times you do it, but there's some patterns that you'll see here that not only apply to this application, but you'll see the same recurring patterns in other event-driven applications. This is certainly what I'm seeing in the other things that I've been doing along these lines in completely different applications. But the the processes, there's this kind of nice pattern that's emerging that like I reuse over and over. And all the, the designs that I've been doing. So to start out, um, when I first started working with Calyx and I was learning it myself, which wasn't that long ago because Calyx is new, I was really doing demos on a shopping cart, you know, the classic shopping cart demo. You know, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, so that I was building a service. So this, this circle here in this diagram represents a, you can think of it, they're called entities in Calyx. But you can also think of it as like a, a small microservice. It's a self-contained service. It has an API. You, you interact with it, and it, uh, it persists data to a database. It can retrieve data from the database, those types of things. So it is, you know, you think of it as a, as a, a, a tight 
focused, loosely coupled microservice. That, that's really what, what this is. So I was building up the shopping cart, you know, adding the, uh, the ability to add items to a cart, to remove items from a cart, to change items in a cart, and to check out a cart. And I was kind of playing with the uh, the programming, you know, the, at the code level, you know, what I was doing, uh, how I would write the code and things like that. And I was, you know, so I was learning, but then I was getting kind of bored with it because it's like, okay, you know, shopping cart, not a big deal. But I, you know, I started thinking, well, it would really be cool to do something more interesting. Like what about, okay, we've got a shopping cart, the shopping cart's been checked out. So what about implementing the process of allocating stock to the shopping cart? So that's where I started to build up. So the first thing I did, I started to add some of that logic to the shopping cart um, service that I had built, but it started to feel like it was getting heavy weight. You know, the design was starting to smell. You know, you know that feeling when you, you you you're doing something and it's like, I'm doing too much here. I really should be kind of breaking this thing up. So, what I did was I introduced a second service that I called Order. So the idea was that shopping cart was focused on building shopping carts. And once a shopping cart was checked out, then it would emit an event, which would be picked up by the order service and the order service would create an order. And so the big difference here is that, you know, with a typical uh, online you know, shopping system, shopping carts could get built and then abandoned and no orders are getting created. So, you know, that data is interesting to analyze, but they're not real orders. So I wanted to kind of have a, a, a kind of a clear delineation between just the code and the services responsible for handling shopping cart and the code that was uh, responsible for handling orders. So that checkout event is a significant event. When a checkout event occurs, the, the shopping cart basically freezes itself. It, you, it, it's no longer possible. The shopping cart service won't allow any more changes to the, to the cart contents because it's been submitted as an order. So when an order gets the shopping cart, now the order goes, okay, now we've got an order that we need to fulfill. So in the order service, I started to add a little bit of like the life cycle into um, an order service. And what I mean by that, here's the, uh, the data structures. The data structure is simple here, but here's the data structure of a shopping cart. And you can see the main thing in the shopping cart on, on the left, this is just some JSON, is it's got a card ID, a customer ID, when a timestamp for it's uh, checked out, and um, there's a deleted flag, uh, but you know, sorry about that. And then there's a list of items in the shopping cart. So you can see there's um, a SKU one with a quantity of two and a SKU two with a quantity of three. Now the order, the, um, data, you know, the, the, this is the, say, the object that the order is, uh, or the state that the order is, is building. It has a, uh, it looks very much like the shopping cart, but it's got some more fields, mostly a bunch of timestamps that kind of show life cycle, like when was it ordered, when was it shipped, when was it delivered, was it returned, was it canceled, those types of things. And then you can see in the order items, which is just a, a list or an array here in JSON, there's also a new field called shipped as well. It's a ship timestamp. So I, so I had the order and then I started thinking, all right, well, what do we do? How do I write the code uh, in this way, doing an event-driven type of approach to, to allocate stock to an order? So I, I started thinking about it and start really implementing it because I, I was kind of at the early stages of the design okay, what's a stock order? What does it do? And how does the, uh, what's the kind of the eventing interaction between order and stock order? So to, right away, I started running into some interesting things. So here I'm taking things down to a little bit more level of detail. So the circles again, represent the microservices, which are called entities in Calyx. So this is a, you know, order is an event source entity stock order is an event source entity and what happens is there's an uh, there's uh this these a's there's one in the center here and there's one right on the edge on the left those are called actions and actions are stateless functions 
And these Vs are views. These are just queryable views. So this is event sourcing and CQRS command query responsibility segregation, where the commands are handled by the service entity and the queries are handled by the views. And in between those is th that each entity has an event term. So what happens is that the action is a function that received that checkout message, that a, that a checkout event from the shopping cart off to the left side here. The action then sends a command to create a new order entity. So the order entity is created. And when it's created, it just simply emits an event like order, order created event, which gets written into the orders event journal. And then that triggers that event is picked up by another action, which the arrow in the center here is this action then is um, responsible for taking that order and getting stock. And this is where things started to get interesting because here an order could have multiple stock items, you know, SKUs to, uh, that we need stock for. And um, we need to, and we need to do this, you know, um, Transactionally, you know, we 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 want to allocate stock to the order, but we don't want, you know, we we want to make sure that this happens precisely and doesn't corrupt the data or anything like that. So, you know, they say that this action uh, function sends a command to the stock order, and the stock order does something, you know, to uh, allocate stock, which emits maybe one or more events to the event room. But the the challenge is that. The problem is it's like we have quantities, like the order has a quantity, you know, that SKU one wants a quantity of two, SKU two wants a quantity of three. And the challenge here is that when we're doing this, we're trying to, uh, you know, say, uh, consume some stock, you know, like I need two of this, you know, so you know, like say that SKU one has, a, you know, maybe 100 in inventory, and we want to reduce that inventory from 100 to 98 because we need two items. So we're doing some kind of a decrement on the inventory quantity. But this is not uh, a, um, a durable, um, totally reliable operation. And the reason being that what can happen is that the event of say decrementing the stock that will trigger the decre decrementing the stock and getting written to the order, the stock order event journal, that could happen, but before it acknowledges that back to the action. The action is waiting for all this to happen so that it knows that the message was consumed. Say something fails, I turned everything red here. Something fails, so the action goes out. That last operation failed. What the actions will do is it's just going to do a retry. Whatever the failure was, when the failure um, is, the problem is resolved and everything's back online, the action is gonna retry that operation. And this is where the problem starts because when we retry the operation, we need to make sure that we don't decrement some more stock. We've, you know, because we, we did decrement some stock, but the action didn't know about it. And now we're gonna, with, because it's got an automatic retry, we're, we're gonna decrement some more stock. So what we're running into here are the first two of four things that I wanna cover here that, that really kind of guide you and are the realities of doing you know, event-driven types of systems. The first one being at least once delivery. So what I was talking about here is that this action is, it is fed by Calix events. And the action then performs some operation. And, what, and only when that action is successful in performing that operation, that tells, tells Calix, all right, it's time to get more events. If when there's a failure of this pr process here and the action doesn't acknowledge or it, it, or it says there was a failure, that tells Calix, okay, we still haven't processed this message, so it's going to retry it. So that's what it, it, um, at least once delivery is. That what it means is that every single message will get delivered, but in some cases, some messages will get delivered more than once which gets into the next point that I've highlighted here that, that the consumer of these messages need to consider item potency. They need to be item potent so that, like in our case, when we do get that same, hey, we need to allocate some stock message twice, that we don't 
um, keep alloc allocating stock over and over and over again until you know, the, the whole operation is successfully completed. This really drives things because now it's like, okay, I can't do it this way. I need to come up with some other uh, way of, of designing the system to, to handle this stock allocation to an order. So I thought, all right, this is getting complicated. So I introduced a, a third service, a third entity I call it shipping order. And in shipping order, the idea was that order is just kind of interested in the full life cycle of handling orders. But the actual process of allocating stock to an order, I was starting to delegate out. I wanted to have something that was just focused on allocating stock. But the same problem exists with shipping order that I had with order between you know, shipping order to stock order or order to stock order. So I needed to do something else. The solution that I finally came up with, and this took some thinking, but, um, but now that I see the pattern, like this is one of these patterns that I see a lot, is I needed to take things down to another level of granularity. And what I mean by that is that what happens here, these arrows represent flows of events between these services. And there's backwards and forwards flows between some of these. And I'll walk through this in more detail in a moment. But what's happening is the shipping order gets created. And here's an order and here's a shipping order. The shipping order takes the order, but you can see that there's an order items list in this shipping order. Hopefully you can see that it's big enough. And then within each order item, there's a sub list of what I called order SKU items, which is the this entity, this new entity that I created. So you can see that for an, a given order item, for whatever the quantity is, there's a uh, an associated uh, number of individual uniquely identified, they each have their own ID, order SKU items. So the quantity is two, so this has a, a two. The quantity for the second SKU item, uh, SKU item, uh, SKU ID two, the quantity is three, so there's three order SKU items. So what's happening is that the shipping order gets created, it emits an event says, hey, I got a new shipping order the action gets that. There's an, another action that receives that event from shipping order. And this action is written to take that event and decompose that one big monolithic shipping order down into five individual, in this example, uh, order SKU items. So five individual order SKU items get created. So what, what's happening here is that the the processes, the design process is, it was being kind of driven by the realities of, of at least once delivery and item potency. I, you know, I don't want to um, consume stock incorrectly and, and, not, and you know, it, it shows that it has been consumed, but this, some stock's not actually needed for a given order because we, we double booked it basically. So I wanna walk through some of these these four things in a little just a little bit of detail. So at um, at at least once delivery is what I was talking about. But this is an example that's very common in uh, other ap approaches. That's called um, at most once delivery. And at most once delivery is kind of like this. You have a function, say some kind of operation, that it does two steps. One step is that it creates an event, say in an event journal. It could be updating a database or you know, do, doing some, some operation. But then it has another operation where, it's second operation where say it's putting something into a topic, in this example, into a coffee topic. The problem with this is this is a two-step operation. And I actually ran across somebody, this isn't uh, Calix code, this is from some other, um, Somewhat somebody else, and I got a I uh, did a screen capture of this snippet of code that, where they have these two examples, and I got red arrows and underlines to kind of show what I'm talking about. But you can see in this code, there's a save state operation, and then there's a publish event operation, and they're they're two separate steps. So what's going on here is that there's this gully, this this gap between the first operation, which persists data to a database, and the second operation, which persists something to a message bus. 
and there's a non-transactional gap between the two. And I grab this picture of this guy jumping across this little gap. It's got, if you, it's kind of hard to see, but it looks like he's got two very expensive cameras in each hand. And um, I don't know if he's made it or not. To me, it doesn't look like he's going to make it. But in any case, the the idea is maybe he makes it because he looks pretty tall and he's got long legs. But I don't know if I'd make it. <laughs> I don't know. And I think other people wouldn't make it. But the point is that this gap here is kind of like you know, this valley of doom or this period of vulnerability in this code. And really what's happening is what's being put into production, and I think this happens a lot, is leaky code that most of the time, like well into the high 90, you know, 90%, 99% range, everything works fine. But every once in a while, there's a failure that happens at the very, very worst time, somewhere in between this operation and the second operation. And now you have data corruption that the, the code obviously wants both of these operations to happen but it's not an atomic operation. So you're kind of going into production with these teeny little leaks that will drive you crazy. I, I've been in this kind of situation and it's not a fun place to be at all. So the solution to this, to get at least once delivery is that the function, the, the producer simply produces whatever they're, they're producing. And then there's some other process running on the side or in the background that is consuming the new data as quickly as possible and uh, passing it on to the consumer. So the, the, the and the, this read side processes I'm calling it, is usually, it, this is a very Kafka-like type of operation. You know, Kafka is famous for, it's just reading by offset. And if it fails, when it restarts, it's just gonna pick up where it left off, which means it could be that some messages that were sent will get sent again. Which is okay as long as you've designed, you, you know that's going to happen, and you design the system for it, then you you can deal with it. Item potency also comes in here because if there's a state changing operation on the consumer side, that state changing operation has to be written where if it when it gets the same message twice, the result is the same as the first time, the second time, the third time, and the nth time, it's an item potent operation. And what I've been doing in the test code that I write for these Calix services is I've, I'm getting in the habit of always writing item potency tests. I've, I'll set up the service, I'll get an entity into a certain state, and then I'll send it a command to make a change of state, so that, and I'll make sure that the state changed the way I want it. And then I'll send that same command again, and I'll make sure that the state still looks like what it's supposed to be. So I'm I'm designing specifically and implementing for item potency. This is multi-transactional as well. This is really important because for for a long time we've lived in a world where we've had you know, this wonderful, uh, comfortable database world where we have these lovely atomic transactions. But when you start to build distributed systems, and which a lot of us are now with microservice systems and things like that, you've left the multi-transactional world. If you have multiple services that are triggering each other to perform, perform state changes outside the bounds of a transaction, you, you need to, to consider these things. If you don't, you're gonna have those leaks, like, you know, those little buckets picking up those little drops of water. Every drop is a unhappy customer, is an unhappy uh, business, is an unhappy manager, is an unhappy developer. The other final thing, the, the fourth thing is that this system is eventually consistent in that the function writes an operation, the data is in the journal, it's there to be used. Sometime later, this read side process is going to pick up that data and, and you know, send it to the consumer, but it doesn't happen as a single atomic operation. It happens as multiple independent operations, which is, um, which is the, the eventual consistency. So going back to this design, this is where things get interesting. And I, I'm gonna walk through some of the higher level parts of it, and then we're gonna focus on the, the, uh, the eventing between the order skew item and the stock skew item. So like I said, you know, there's a client, clients are loading up their own shopping carts. So, you know, I have a shopping cart, you have a shopping cart, somebody else has a shopping cart. Each one of us has our own, our own instance of a shopping cart. The state of each of our shopping carts is you know, what our shopping carts look like. And when somebody presses the, uh, the, the buy button, that triggers an event, you know, like a checkout event. And that checkout event 
emit, is emitted by the shopping cart and there's an action that picks it up and sends a command to a downstream service, in this case, order, to say, hey, order, we need to create a new order. When an order is created, it emits an event. And here I just want to show where the same event could be picked up by multiple consumers. So in this case, there's an order item. I'm not really going to go into detail on this because this is just used for like an example of doing um, queries and, and um, uh, manipulating data. But the shipping order picks up the, the event. When the shipping order picks up the event, like I said before, it emits an event and says, hey, I got this new shipping order. It's blown up internally the order items into the order SKU item sublist. That whole object gets passed to uh, the action. There's an, and that action take kind of uh, decomposes the, the single shipping order into the multiple order SKU items. Again, the example, two, uh, two order items, um, one quantity of two, one quantity of three. That means that that action is going to send, five, send out five commands to five different order SKU items to be created. And this starts a, a kind of a whole cascade of uh, a lot of concurrent operations that are, that are happening all at the same time. When the order SKU item, order SKU items are created, they emit events, which then start a process of trying to hunt down available stock for that you know, order SKU item. And this is where I want to dive into more detail um, of how the interaction occurs in an event-driven flow between the order SKU item and the stock SKU item. If you grok this, then I think uh, this is one of the most important things. It's just kind of you know, how, how this whole flow works. So I'm just going to walk through it step by step. So we've got the order, we've got the shipping order. Remember, again, the shipping order, there was there's multiple order SKU items. We've taken each one of these order SKU items that were built into the into the shipping order, but now we've created individual entities for each of these order SKU items. So what happens is the action that pick that sends those commands to order SKU item, create a new order SKU item that produces an event. That event gets picked up. There's some views that pick up the events, but um, that's not the main thing here. The, the, the event also gets picked up by an, another action. Remember, actions are stateless functions. They're kind of the glue uh, that, that ties everything together because actions are the things that can do things like perform a query. So in this case, that's exactly what this action does. It got a message from the adventure. Calix passed a message and invoked the function to say, hey, I've got this new message for you. The function gets that message. And the first thing it does is it performs a query against this view. And this view is um, set up for uh, doing a query against available stock SKU items you know, for, for a given stock ID. So the query result comes back and there's two possible outcomes. Either there is available stock for this SKU item I, or it, there's no available stock. If there's no available stock, the action is just going to, in turn, send a command back to the order SKU item and say, hey, put yourself into a back order state. Right now, there's no stock available. And I'll get back to this one in a minute. However, if there is stock available, what the action will do, it will, it will grab one of those available stock SKU items, and it will build a command to send to that stock SKU item service. And the, the service request is I need the order SKU item effectively wants to join with a stock SKU item. It, we, we want to identify, here's a specific order SKU item, and we want a physical unit of stock for, <coughs> excuse me, for that order SKU item. So the command comes into the stock SKU item, and there's two possible outcomes here. Either the stock SKU item is still available, or it's not. So it's the, the request is either accepted or it's rejected. Now, the reason this can happen, again, this uh, it's the eventual consistency that between the time we do the query and the time we actually get the command into the stock SKU item, there's no locking going on here. And somebody else could have grabbed that stock SKU item that um, this command is going for, and it's no longer available. So the, uh, the idea is that the stock SKU item is the single point of processing of, of handling this. No locks are required because it's a single writer uh, type of a, a principle here. So if the stock SKU item uh, takes that command and if it's still available, it will accept the join request. If it's not available, 
that were rejected during request. So in either case, it produces an event that gets picked up by a third action, which is taking the event from the stock skew item and sending a command to the order skew item. If the join was accepted, then the order skew item is updated. You know, its state is changed to, to reflect, yep, we've, we've got an, a stock skew item for this order skew item. If it was rejected, what that's going to trigger is that specific order skew item is going to just simply emit an event that's going to trigger the whole process all over again to try and find an available uh, stock skew item. So this is the way the system works. The, the really interesting thing here is that we've got two independent, very loosely coupled microservices here, order skew item and stock skew item. They're both making independent non-transactional state changes, but because of the design of the sequence of events that you know, I designed as a design, you know, the, the designer of this system, they come to a mutually agreeable set of state changes. You know, first, the stock skew item, if it accepts a join request, it changes its state to say, yep, I know exactly what order skew item I belong to. It updates itself with that information. Then that stock skew item emits an event, which goes back to the order skew item. And the order skew item gets that, that command and says, ah, I've got a, an available stock skew item. I'm going to change my state to reflect the stack, the, the state, the status that um, I've, I've been allocated stock. So it the nice thing about this is that each one of these services are really simple. There's barely any business logic in it. The the kind of the the, the fun of this is the actual design of the sequence of events that goes on between these two things, which honestly, to be honest with you, it, it took me some time to work out just because it was this, this was one of my first exercises to go in this much detail of doing it. But like I said, now that I've, I've gone through this, I've, I've seen the same pattern in other things that I'm doing and this kind of uh, sequence of events where you come with, up with mutually agreeable state changes is getting to be second nature to me now. It's, it's it's quite easy. Also, the brilliance of this is that this is a dead solid type of implementation. Anything can break here. And when it recovers, it self-heals. It just picks up where it left off. So anything can break and it just keeps going. And of course it scales and, and all those other things. And because of the way, because I'm doing it at a at kind of a lower level of granularity, I'm not doing it at, at an order level of granularity. This is all happening like at the items, the individual stock items that need to be allocated. It's a high degree of concurrency that's happening here. So in a real system processing lots of orders, this would be you know, simple database operations. We're just inserting events into journals. Those events are being picked up, sent to actions, actions make decisions, do queries, that, that type of thing. And then the, the individual services basically perform very simple non-locking, non-blocking types of operations, and the system just kind of screams, you know, screams along as, it, as it's doing this. No leaks as well. It's all taking into consideration um, at least once delivery. It means every single message will get delivered. It's built to be solid in that the, each of these operations are designed, and I was kind of driven to the design to make them item potent so it, it can handle when multiple, you know, the same message is delivered more than once, no problem, and it, and it's fast and durable. Now, one other thing I want to cover here is that when new stock is added, new stocks, you item entities are created, and when that happens, those they just trigger events and say, "Hey, I've got a new stock SKU item." That event gets written to the journal, which gets picked up by this um, action on the left. What it does is it does a query against the view that is a, a view is there to, to um, look up back ordered order SKU items by SKU ID. So that if the query finds some, some back ordered um, uh, SKU items or order SKU items, it's going to then send a command to that order SKU item and say, hey, I've got some stock to join with you. So now the, pro the flow is reversed. I've been talking about from order skew item to stock skew item in that flow, but the, the kind of the, the same flow, but now in the reverse direction, stocks hunting down order skew items instead of order skew items hunting down stock. Uh, but it, you know, there's a lot of symmetry here in, in the way this, this works. So 
that's the, the behavior here. So the stock skew item, you know, does all this work. It emits it, those events. You know, we've seen this at, at a lower level of detail here uh, in the, the past few minutes. The order skew item, when it changes its state, it emits an event that goes back to the shipping order and the shipping order is updating its state to reflect individual order SKU items that have been allocated stock. And what's happening here, you can see like this is on the left, these are a couple of, of the order SKU items. And you can see now there's an order SKU ID underlined the first underline, and then there's a, a stock SKU ID, the second underline. So you can see that these, both of these order SKU items uh, have been allocated stock. So the, these order SKU items emitted an event with this information, which goes back to the shipping order. So the shipping order hunts down, it just digs into the order items list and then the order SKU items sub list and hunts down that order SKU item and it changes its state in there as well. So now that the shipping order sees every change as different units of stock are allocated to the shipping order. And then it can monitor the progress. And you know, so for example, when all of the items within a given um, order SKU items within a, within a given order item have been allocated stock, it will emit an event that says, all right, um, SKU one is, we have all the stock we need for SKU one. And the same thing would happen for SKU two, which means that um, the shipping order is emitting events which are updating or changing the state of the order item. You know, the order item has ship dates in it as well. So the whole shipping process flows back upstream from stock SKU item to order SKU item to shipping order back to order to show that you know, the state of the order, it, you know, have we found all the stock that we that we need for an order or is, is something still not it's something back ordered, that type of thing. And uh, you can see here. Um, you know, all the uh, the the ship dates, our timestamps are are updated, and the 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 associated order has um, that shipped to UTC. It was kind of at the default 1970 timestamp, and now it's at a um, you know a current timestamp to indicate that uh, we found stock for for all this order. So that's the flow in the in this system. Um, Another thing I want to point out, though, is that um, the shipping order, this this concept of list of like a parent, you know, sh you can think of the shipping order as kind of a parent um, to the the order skew item children, and there's kind of a one to many relationship, and this this pattern of having the parent have a detailed list of its children is also kind of a recurring theme because this provides item potency as well. When a, say, a stock allocated event is sent to a shipping order for the same um, order SKU item ID more than once, those are item potent operations. If I was just like changing a counter, that would be uh, impossible to make it as a, or not impossible, but it would be more difficult to make it as an item potent operation. So part of the reasons for this sublist is also to handle item potency as data flows back upstream from the order SKU items to the, um, uh, the to the shipping order and to the to the order itself. So um, in this adventure of design. These things are really important. You, you have to think as you're going through the design, you have to think about it at least once delivery. Your, your, your services are going to get the same message more than once. How do you build an item potency? That will drive your design. I, this, every time I've gone through design, it's, more, it's kind of an intellectual exercise. How do I design this? How do I unlearn what I've known before and learn something new? and redesign my flow into something that takes the realities of at least once delivery, which is great because every single message will get delivered versus the alternative, which many people use, which scares the heck out of me, is that they're using at most once delivery or some kind of sloppy retry without item potency. That just, I think is a nightmare. Uh, here, you just kind of go, it's kind of like go with the flow. You're going to work through the design process, 
you're going to run into something and you're going to say, oh, oh man, this is not an item put in operation. And my, I think the, the voice in your head should be, you need to make it item potent. It's like Luke, uh, you know, go with the force. <laughs> you know, that, that it's the same thing. Luke, go for item potency, figure it out, you know, redesign the flow so that you're, you're dealing with the reality of least once delivery and your operations are item potent because that will make it so that, you know, things are multi-transactional and also you have to consider things like eventual consistency. I showed you a little bit of that as well, that the you have to, to, to consider that. So a lot of the event flows are kind of um, a saga type flows because of, 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 of this the, these uh, realities of, of building event-driven types of systems. And that's it. A um, little bit, hopefully a little bit quicker session here. The QR code is for the, excuse me, for the GitHub repo of this demo project. It's a Java version of the demo project. And um, it, you know, it's the one I use to, to test and play with and the logging's fun to watch when you enter orders and um, you know, things like that. So uh, feel free to grab that and, and play with it and you know, look, look at the code. The codes, you know, for the most part, it, the actual business logic, the code, is pretty straightforward. The fun part is the design piece of it. So I don't know if we have any questions, but um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'll, I'll hang around for some questions, but uh, otherwise we're, we're 